Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome to Time Travel Tingles, where we combine tingles and nostalgia, as decided by you. So, this is the first episode of Time Travel Tingles of 2014. And for those of you who uh, don't know, Time Travel Tingles is uh, was formerly known Travel Tuesday, but I've changed the name uh, so that it doesn't necessarily always come out on a Tuesday, but the concept is the same. Uh, normally, the episodes are driven by your votes. You'll vote in the comments section on your favorite uh, piece of nostalgia from any time period, and I will create a video uh, telling you all about the particular topic that won the vote. So, for today's time travel tingles, I chose the topic, um, just since it's been uh, so long since the most recent time travel tingles. But from this point forward, it will go back to normal, where you guys will vote and I choose the topic based on uh, your votes. Okay. So, the topic that I chose for the first time travel tingles of the year is He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, uh, which was an 80s cartoon and uh, also a line of toys. So, I'll show you what I have here to share with you. And then I'll tell you everything that I know about He-Man. So, as you can see, I have my uh, Castle Grayskull, which is the home and fortress of the story's protagonist. He-Man. <laughs> and I've got my little He-Man action figure as well. Uh, with his furry bikini. <laughs> and down here, I think that this actually belongs inside the castle, uh, but it appears to be broken, so I put it out here. But this is a sort of weapons wall that holds uh, swords and battle axes and things like that. So I have a battle He-Man that fits in his grip, which I'll show you. That's how that works. And I'll show you He-Man uh, more in depth in a bit. So I've got him also have uh, the story's antagonist, Skeletor. And then Skeletor has his little uh, scepter staff thing, which has been not very subtly hot glued back. So have a battle cat who is He Man's sort of trusty companion. And I'll tell you more about him. And then basically the evil version of Battle Cat. 
this is Skeletor's companion. Um, Panther. And he has a little saddle thing for Skeletor to ride. So I've got parts of the He-Man playset. And these are all um, none of these are like collector's versions. These are all just straight out of some kids' bedroom in the 80s. Um, all of these are pretty uh, careworn. So, uh, yeah, you can just sort of see how much they've been played with. They're not in very good condition at all. But I think that makes it cooler. A little more authentic. So that's what I have to show you. And as I show you all these items, I'm going to tell you everything that I know about He-Man. So let's begin. Okay. So. Yeah, this is Castle Grayskull. And I think it's really cool. So, um, He-Man is an American television series, cartoon, that is produced by Filmation, and it is based on Mattel's, the toy company Mattel, um, their toy line, Masters of the Universe. So the toys actually came before the TV show. The show was based on the I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, it debuted in sort of power is what it's called. He learns that when he holds it up and says, by the power of Grayskull, um, he is transformed into He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. And then once he's transformed, he says, of He-Man when he's transformed. 
really fierce and brave. So, generally what's going on is um, the idea is that He-Man defends Eternia from who is trying pretty much always to conquer Castle Grayskull. Castle Grayskull is pretty much where He-Man sort of derives most of his powers, sort of. So, I'm gonna interrupt myself and open this up for you to see the inside and all the cool things that it used to do. It doesn't really do them anymore because it's kind of worse for wear. But it has some really neat features. Okay, so I'm going to show you the inside of Castle Grayskull. down like that. And I like that feature a lot. I think it's cool. I like little thumbnails. Like secret passageway type things like that. I wanted to show you that real quick. Put it back. Oh. Nope. It's dislodged. Well, now I can show it to you. Um, so it looks like this. It's kind of like a big scary tongue with teeth. Um, go with the Grayskull looks like on the inside. Well, it's what it looks like now. Um, I think new it looks pretty different because there are certain elements missing from this one because it's been so uh, heavily played with. So, some of the features that I understood this toy to have are pretty cool. So this, this right here is, or was, I believe, a kind of uh, elevator that could go up through this section, up and down, through this opening. Uh, 
by uh, some sort of um, pulley system, I think. So you could um, set one of your action figures on the platform and then raise him up to the other uh, level of the castle. So that's cool. And then right here, this opening here, I believe that's where this used to go. This was um, a little trap door that belongs here. So someone could have their action figure standing right here and then by moving this sort of throne chair thing um, it activated something I believe that would release move the chair and then whoever was standing here would drop to the dungeon below. And I'm pretty sure it's a dungeon because there's a really scratched up, difficult to identify sticker here on this bottom level. That looks like a big dungeon gate. creatures that are trying to get out. So yeah, I think when you fall from the trap door, you can, I don't know, probably you're supposed to fall into the dungeon. So that's clever. The other cool thing I'll show you is this little lookout. So is meant to be a second one right here. A little bit smaller, but it has a, a gunner thing. A little gun that you can uh, use to defend Castle Grayskull. This was a really highly sought after toy in the 80s. He-Man fans. And uh, I think it was a really, really popular uh, Christmas gift one year. I can't remember which year, but this playset in particular was a really big deal. Okay. So, these are all the Sides of Castle Grayskull. So now I will show you all the rest of my action figures and accessories and get back to telling you about uh, E-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Okay, so here is He-Man. armor that actually rotates. And I think the idea is that, um, it might be hard to see, the idea is that when he gets hit, uh, it'll spring the armor to this got another setting that looks even more damaged. So when you're playing with your action 
action figures and making them fight. Uh, it looks like he uh, has taken some hits. I think that's clever. Um, and I don't know if you can tell, there's a little bit of yellow paint sort of left on his hair, but it looks mostly white. He's supposed to be uh, blonde. So, uh, Mattel, the toy company, uh, developed the original He Man. first ever syndicated show to be based on a toy line. So, uh, the cartoon was really just a vehicle for the Masters of the Universe toy line, rather than the other line of toys coming out to accompany a popular TV show. They actually created the cartoon pretty much to sell toys, which I think is funny. So, um, on the show, uh, He-Man was uh, able to do something kind of different for the time, which was feature a superhero that could actually hit his opponents, um, which He-Man actually didn't do very much, but that was pretty, apparently pretty unheard of. for a while surrounding the He-Man cartoon uh, from parents who, I guess, realized that the 
show was designed to basically market the toys to children. And it was kind of a big deal because during this time, um, advertising to kids was um, kind of controversial, more so than it is now. And in the UK, the advertising regulations that were in place at the time made it so that uh, no he-man uh, commercials or commercials for the he-man toy could accompany the program itself. So if the he-man cartoon was on the a commercial break. Um, there couldn't be any commercials for the He-Man toy airing, which is interesting. Okay, I'm gonna put He-Man down. This is technically a battle cat toy and not a cringer toy. Um, however, the armor that is supposed to uh, go over his head and back is not here. I'm not sure where it is, but I don't have it. Here he is. son saw this toy earlier and didn't really realize that it was a tiger. So he pointed at it and went, lizard, lizard. So I think because it was green and orange, he thought it was a lizard. I thought it was funny. Anyway, so this is the makers of the He-Man cartoon were getting so much negative publicity from uh, parents or about parents not approving of the show uh, and how it was used as a marketing tactic um, they wanted to sort of minimize that so they sort of There was um, a spin-off show called She-Ra because He-Man was so successful. They made a spin-off show that also did pretty well. Um, about his supposed twin sister who also, I think, was able to access the man had some actually some kind of big names on uh, 
writing side of things in the early um, script writing. Some of those big names included uh, someone called J. Michael Straczynski. some writing, also some writing, done by um, Paul Dini and Bryn Stevens, um, both of whom went on to write uh, really popular episodes of Batman the Animated Series. And then of course, uh, there was David Wise, who the head writer of the TV version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, I think one of the most interesting things I learned origin of He-Man is that before He-Man came to be uh, in 1996 Mattel, the toy company had a request come in to uh, produce a line of action figures for a little movie that was scheduled to come out the following year in 1977. Um, they, the CEO of Mattel, turned down is Panthor. He's uh, the evil counterpart to Battle Cat. He's the
I love this one in particular. I think this one's my favorite. Because I don't know if you can really tell. Maybe you can see it. But um this figure is covered in velvet. So he's really uh, soft and velvety. It's just such a cool texture. It's pretty much identical. I just showed you. Except that he's bright purple and velvety. And of course, very evil. I like this one a lot. He-Man was first developed. The very first prototypes uh, were created by Mattel's lead designer, a man named um, Roger Roger Sweet. And the way he created them in order to another action figure that was uh, I don't know if it was popular at this time but it was an action figure called Big Jim which is also a Mattel product I think so he took a Big Jim action figure He-Man toys were actually uh, just kind of like bigger versions of Big Jim with some other stuff going on though. And He-Man was given that name So that he could be really generic. He was actually given as generic a name as they could think of on purpose. So that he could be sort of dropped into any Conan Properties International, which is the company that owns um, all of the intellectual property surrounding um, Conan the Barbarian. What happened was that uh, a rumor He-Man, the action figure, was based upon the Conan the Barbarian character as portrayed by um, 
Arnold Schwarzenegger in the film in the 80s. at the time, early prototypes of He-Man were actually brunette instead of blonde. So they bore a very strong resemblance to Conan the Barbarian. But they denied that that was the case. They said that the idea for He-Man had Started being developed before the film even happened. But that brown haired prototype version of He Man that I told you about was um, being released through a promotion. won the lawsuit with Conan Properties International and were able to retain the rights to He-Man because that's what Conan International was after. They were trying to say that um, because there was no licensing agreement to uh, have Mattel action figures for Conan, but that they bore such a strong resemblance to Conan the Barbarian that they uh, should have the rights to He-Man, but they lost, and Mattel retained those rights. So that's good. Interestingly, though, were several different versions of He-Man that were pitched before it was decided on that he was, uh, you know, a prince slash superhero. And so, originally, what was chosen was uh, a barbarian. So, it was really, really also wanted to make a sequel uh, to the first live-action film. 
but it didn't um, end up happening. And I think what happened was that the production company who did the first one using Masters of the Universe again. Uh, I just didn't think it was worth it. And you're probably right. So the movie didn't happen. But a bunch of um, costumes and film sets had already been created. So those ended up used on the set of uh, a movie that came out a little bit later called Cyborg starring Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, if I'm not mistaken that movie didn't do very well either so that's funny Skeletor sort of namesake for a building that is in uh, a city in uh, Poland and the building's name or nickname I don't know if I'm going to say this right but I think it's um, pronounced like Skeletor maybe it's spelled S C-K-I-E-L-E-T-O-R And the reason it's nicknamed Skeletor is that um, in the early 80s or maybe late 70s it was started they started building Due to a lot of different factors, um, economic issues, political unrest, um, and also the uh, kind of imposition of martial law in Poland. Uh, because of all those things, the building just um, they stopped. I mean, construction on it in 1981. And it's still standing there today. But it's unfinished. And it looks like the skeleton of a building. So it's sort of just been nicknamed and is now known as Skeletor, or however it's pronounced. And you can see pictures of it line and it's actually used now to uh, display big billboard ads, really big ones. So it's just kind of like a big construct to put ads all over. It's really interesting. That doesn't have that much to do with the He-Man uh, franchise, but I thought it was an standing there and people have tried to uh, get it to I don't know, like purchase it so that they could continue building on it or demolish it but it just um, hasn't been possible for some reason so it's just there
an episode. Uh, and it's called, I think the episode is called Evil Sea. He-Man and Skeletor, even though they're arch-rivals, had to kind of team up and work together to defeat a sort of common enemy known as Evil Seed, who was like this evil plant man <laughs> who could, who had control. vicious plants that were taking over Eternia and growing wild and he was apparently a threat to both of these guys so I think they kind of reluctantly had to team up with one another to defeat Evil Seed and then I imagine they just went back I'm demonstrating here. <laughs> this is combat. This is what combat looks like, apparently. Okay. enjoyed this time travel tingles the first one of the year and I hope that you found it interesting and informative and relaxing now the voting starts with this video so don't forget to leave your votes in the comments below seeing you again very soon. But until then, sweet dreams. individuality. When this region is enlarged, the patient tends to be a person with a very high opinion of themselves.